Um, let me begin by thanking Mark Donfried and the boards of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy for the invitation to speak here today and um, for the very active organizing this conference. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made that international convenings like this, which facilitate the sharing of knowledge and development of new ideas and building of connections, are themselves an important component of cultural diplomacy. Uh, I'd also like to thank our hosts here at the Razi School. Uh, a good deal of the recent work of the John Bradamus Center has been exploring how arts and cultural programs can connect Western and Muslim communities, both globally and within countries. And so it's an honor for me to be here today to be able to share in this setting some of the things we've learned. Um, the Bradamus Center uh, is a small policy center at NYU. And for the last 10 years, we've been doing research, organizing international conferences, and doing outreach in this field of cultural diplomacy or international cultural exchange, or as we've been calling it uh, more and more, cultural mobility. Uh, in particular, we look at the civil society actors who are engaged in cultural mobility, moving art, moving art artists, and ideas across borders, and engaging communities. Uh, so it's probably useful here to make a small distinction. Uh, as we see it, cultural diplomacy tends to look more at what governments and international organizations are doing in this area, uh, often with a broad stroke and a focus on policy. Uh, and we ourselves actually started out uh, in that exploration. Um, but as the ICD is a testament to, there are already a lot of very smart people working seriously on this. Uh, where my colleagues and I felt we can make more of a contribution is in the study of cultural mobility. Uh, and by this we mean how the artists and practitioners who do this work on the ground engage in this activity. Uh, and from the US perspective, means a greater focus on the role of philanthropy and private foundations in supporting this work and in building the institutional capacity of nonprofits who organize international travel, residencies, exhibitions, festivals, and connectivity through social media and other technologies. By working with stakeholders in cultural mobility, the artists, cultural professionals, private funders, uh, we've been trying to help them build the arguments for this work, their motivations, the impact on the artists themselves, the impact on the communities where they travel and where they engage through exhibitions and performances uh, to help them to articulate the challenges they face and develop recommendations for increasing this activity. Uh, we do this by undertaking quantitative research into the field of cultural mobility, uh, building data on trends in funding, and spoiler alert, it's pretty bad and it's getting worse, um, and looking at the networks and levels of connectivity between actors, both the funders and the practitioners. Uh, we also do this through qualitative analysis uh, by organizing these international convenings, which bring together artists, professionals, funders, and scholars for discussions. We look at how the artists and practitioners are doing the work, motivations, challenges, successes, what the impacts are on audiences and community, and what are the needs of this field. One of the biggest challenges in the field is that there is still a lot we don't know. And the arts and humanities do not lend themselves easily to measurement and analysis. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to advance support for cultural mobility because uh, ROI, return on investment, is what public and private funders most want to hear about. Uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't things we can say about the field. And I'll share with you a few of our findings. Uh, funding. In the US, we're operating in a field of declining federal government funding in the arts in general, and cultural mobility in particular. In fact, the current administration's uh, proposed eliminating the National Endowments for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, it's not likely to go through, but it is uh, a signal of their priorities. Uh, I should note one bright spot in terms of public funding in the US, and that's cities. Uh, mayors on the ground get it. Uh, they get that the arts are an engine of economic development, 
and they get that having a creative class in their city attracts other professionals. Uh, but when you're aggregating nationally, I mean, it's still relatively minuscule funding. Uh, we also face a daunting landscape for private funding of international cultural exchange here in the US. Uh, as background, the last major study of this was a 2008 report from the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation. And at that point, 2008, they had already showed a uh, divestment of international cultural funding from the previous five years. Uh, my center uh, is currently doing research and will be releasing it later uh, this fall, um, showing uh, the most recent trends in funding. Uh, since, so in 2008 with the recession and global financial crisis, there was a steep drop in arts exchange funding. And that funding has not yet recovered, uh, either in dollar amounts or in the number of grants being made by private foundations. Uh, in fact, in the six year study period between 2009 and 2015, according to data from the Foundation Center, out of a total $23 billion, 23 billion in foundation grants in the field of arts and culture, uh, just $150 million, so that's 0.65% of those grants went to international exchanges. Uh, and in terms of the lack of diversity among funding, uh, just 34 foundations each contributed over $1 million toward that total. Um, so what this means is there's not a very large group of foundations supporting cultural mobility, uh, which also uh, means the funding is precarious if one or two of those funders pulls out. Uh, so, and to put this uh, in more perspective, total giving by US foundations in the year 2015 was about $58 billion. Total giving by, for all charitable purposes by foundations, $58 billion. Uh, that year, foundations made 16.4 million grants in cultural mobility, travel grants, residencies, and uh, exhibitions that, and performances that cross borders. That's 0.00028% of all foundation giving went to this field. Uh, at a time of shrinking federal dollars for the arts in general and exchanges in particular, the funder community in the US offers a, only a tiny sliver of funding and a declining one of that. Uh, so it's pretty clear we have a long way to go in convincing public and private funders why they should be supporting cultural mobility. Uh, part of that is making the case for the inherent value of the arts and humanities. And another part is making the case for their positive impact on international cultural programs on the communities where they're uh, uh, going and how societies approach each other across borders. Um, this case has to be made both to policymakers as well as to private funders who perhaps are currently supporting social justice, conflict resolution, community development, but who have not yet seen how the arts can contribute to those efforts. So why the arts? Um, we've been challenging stakeholders to come up with the arguments for the arts and for international exchange. Two of the most important themes that have come through uh, are how the arts relate to narrative and storytelling and how the arts foster empathy. And of course, those two are related, uh, both in our work generally on mobility, but particularly in the meetings we've held on how arts can combat Islamophobia uh, the issue of narrative comes up repeatedly. Uh, for example, the author and scholar Hussein Rashid uh, of Columbia University talks about how American Muslims are caught in a national security narrative. Other Americans think either you're a good Muslim or a bad Muslim, either you're reporting to the FBI and the activities of your fellow worshipers at the mosque, or you're plotting to join ISIS. And Americans not of Muslim faith think all Muslims are either Arab or Pakistani. Um, particularly through popular culture and entertainment, storytelling can offer language to help America understand itself and Americans differently. It can tell a story of how that most American of American art forms, jazz, can first be heard in the fluttering notes of the Adan, the Muslim call to prayer, which 
then carried over into the slave spirituals, which carried all the way down to the blues. It's the telling of the story of the diversity of Muslim culture from Morocco to Indonesia, from Turkey to Nigeria, of showing through literature, painting, film, TV, how American Muslims and Muslims in other countries confront the same daily challenges of home and work, love and loss, the millions of ways, big and small, we all live similar lives. It's part of the thousands of young people all over the country who turn up for shows or watch on Netflix, uh, Dave Chappelle or uh, the comedian Aziz Ansari. And for these young people, they're getting a different story about what being Muslim in America means and what about being an American means. It's no longer, quote, unquote, the other. And this leads to empathy. The arts offer a visceral connection between the artist, the piece of work itself, and the viewer. In the moment, they offer a connection with the other, the stranger, the foreigner. They offer a closeness and proximity. Uh, the great difficulty is that we understand this intuitively and even experientially, but it's difficult to quantify. Uh, but there are increasing attempts to do just that. Uh, there's research now into the neuroscience of art, particularly how art stimulates those areas of the brain related to empathy and social connectivity. And there's a growing body of research by social psychologists and behavioral economists that what's more important than IQ in determining success is empathy and connectivity. Uh, Google itself has studied how its teams work, developing ways to measure the level of empathy among the team, and come up with ways to foster greater empathy. They're doing this because they've seen better outcomes from teams that exhibit higher levels of empathy. Uh, so we know more and more that empathy is important. Now it's about making the connection between the arts and empathy. Uh, there are numerous other arguments that stakeholders have been uh, articulating. I'll just mention one more uh, given the topic of this conference, and that's that the arts are empowering for artists and for communities because one of the core principles of human rights is that people are equal in dignity. There is no dominant culture. Uh, let me say a few words about challenges. Uh, in addition to the relatively small pool of private funding available in the US for cultural mobility, artists and practitioners face some other challenges. Uh, first, they often don't know where to start looking when they uh, are thinking about doing a cultural exchange uh, of where to go to find the financial and logistical support that is available. Uh, another challenge for the field is the pressure artists feel to write their applications based on what they think the funder wants to hear. Uh, it's a particular frustration of having to speak in a vocabulary based in metrics while working in a field of qualitative storytelling. Visas. Uh, securing a visa, particularly for those coming from developing nations to the US, is a burden for artists unfamiliar with the process and without funds. And it's uh, the arrogance of American policy making because visa policies are traditionally reciprocal. So if the US places a large burden on foreign artists, the other country will do the same for American artists trying to travel there. So just when we need to face uh, we need face-to-face -face interactions to understand each other better. Uh, we Americans are making it that much harder. And that was even before the current president's Muslim travel ban and so-called extreme vetting. Uh, one of the biggest concerns cultural practitioners and artists admit that they face is audience. Will people buy tickets to something in a foreign language, something to which they haven't been exposed before? And how do we inspire curiosity among those we haven't already reached? Uh, practitioners constantly have to uh, get better at getting beyond self-selecting audiences. Uh, there's a challenge of how to sustain connections made through exchanges both among artists and between the artists and the community. And finally, cultural mobility doesn't have an institutional base that facilitates conversation the way other arts fields in the US do, such as the League of American Orchestras or the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. Uh, which is now performing arts professionals. So artists and practitioners have a particular challenge in that they lack a space for uh, getting together on a regular basis to develop and share knowledge about innovations in the field and lack a dedicated advocacy organization for their work. Um, technology can help address some of these challenges. Uh, one of the most recent ways uh, technology has impacted how artists uh, work is in the area of funding. 
uh, crowdsourcing through GoFundMe or Kickstarter or similar websites help artists get new support, uh, particularly for work that doesn't interest traditional funders. At the same time, it helps build audience by making these micro donor donors co-investors. Uh, and we're now at a point where Kickstarter raises more money annually for artistic projects than the NEA gives away in grants. Uh, second, uh, technology bypass bypassing traditional gatekeepers of media uh, can enable artists, activists, and everyday users to drive the global conversation. It's the shareability of social media uh, to reach a mainstream audience, the ability to reach beyond these self-selecting audiences I referred to before, and a chance to build grassroots support. It facilitates an instant material exchange between young artists. Uh, finally, let me share some of the recommendations uh, for the field that have been coming out of this work we've been doing. Uh, funders, producers, and distributors of arts and culture need to become better at being gatekeepers for art and artists. Uh, there's a lot of good talent out there. Uh, with the funding community's help, artists can turn their creativity and talent and instincts into social change. There's a need for stronger pipelines to find and promote young storytellers. Uh, funders need to move beyond known quality, quantities and embrace artists who have a new story to tell. Uh, this includes more dangerous and controversial projects and artists that don't align with the funder's viewpoint. Uh, funders need to reinforce artists and arts organizations for the long run. Uh, too often it's the new kid or the next hot project that gets a burst of support and then the funders move on. Uh, funders and institutions have a responsibility to let artists and practitioners try and fail. Uh, too much caution inhibits innovation and creativity on the part of artists. Uh, more grants uh, should be made with the expectation that projects are going to fail uh, so that this way the artists can take risks. Uh, this in turn will help the funders and practitioners develop uh, better strategies and models uh, to be shared. Uh, for U.S. funders supporting artists and projects in developing nations, in addition to grants uh, for work preserving traditional culture, we need more support of uh, contemporary art forms by local artists. Foundations need to be more flexible uh, internally in moving dollars between programs so that uh, artists can apply to social justice and, and other uh, non-traditional arts programs within foundations. Uh, Funders need to explore more partnerships to leverage their resources in the field. Uh, this includes developing tools to make information on what's currently available for travel grants and residencies more accessible to American, foreign, uh, American and foreign artists, practitioners, and professionals. Uh, practitioners should develop more exchange programs that include strong community ties and outreach. Uh, foreign artists engaging local communities can help build trust across cultures, countering negative trends of globalization. Uh, artists uh, need to be given a voice in the types of technology that are being developed and used so it can better meet their needs uh, for collaboration and distribution. Uh, the field needs more research into the extent and funding of international cultural activity. Uh, it includes uh, improved collection categorization uh, by organizations like the Foundation Center, which serves as a clearinghouse for information on grant making, um, because we need to make this data more accessible and more accurate for scholars who are doing the work. Uh, improved data will lead to improved understanding. Uh, and the field also needs more research on the impact of exchanges on communities, and something that um, some colleagues over at uh, USC's Center for Public Diplomacy are working on now. And finally, we need uh, more conversations. Only through coming together in forums like this, or the ones that the Bradhamus Center has been organizing, can we build the arguments and develop the recommendations uh, for advancing this important activity. Thank you. Be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. I was talking to you before we started and saying that I started out as an artist 
so I have a certain sympathy for what you're talking about. Uh, but uh, what are your um, ideas on the idea of uh, identity and artwork and, and the uh, contribution to self work? Um, it's Particularly in the work we, were, we did at this conference on addressing Islamophobia through the arts, identity was uh, so caught up in the issue of storytelling um, as sort of yet another one of these like vitally uh, important components of how the arts work. Um, it's and it's a it's a two way dialogue. So it's uh, how sort of the artist sees identity and how the artist expresses identity uh, in his or her work. Um, and then it's how uh, the person viewing the artwork or experiencing the artwork uh, begins to recognize identity. Um, so it's a, um, I mean, the arts are just this very powerful, because, of, because the connections are so visceral, uh, this very powerful tool for uh, sort of changing notions of identity. Additional questions or comments? Hi, <coughs> my name is Amy Hanazan. I'm a global fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Um, my work has been artist-led because I come from an artistic background. I'm a cultural diplomat and an academic. Um, one of the great, um, and I thank you for your insightful um, speech this afternoon, one of the great growths that has triggered my career has been the residencies pro program. As you're aware, um, America has very many residencies that are funded by private donors, such as, you know, the Yardo and McDowell at a high level. But at a lower level, there's, I've just come from a residency at the Haynes Center in Georgia. And they're an actual, they're very well funded, and they're um, a very good a repository and a very good reservoir for you to, to contemplate, because I think that that, and there's um, a very good database website called Res Artists, mm -hmm. um, that, that really allows the exchange of ideas and artists to really um, take root in a new, a new country or a different country. And um, those sorts of collaborations are very useful for seeding people's careers in this area and seeding ideas, because a lot of projects that I contributed between China and my country um, have started there and they have continued. So I think as a learning tool it's for beginning artists for them to consider the, the ideas. And of course, at just recently at the Lincoln Festival, a lot of the, the productions were very much issues based and, and cross-cultural. And even next week at BAM we have an opera that's been means and Kronos Quartet dealing with issues. So I think looking at those those um, examples, um, whether you know how your university can cooperate with them, and as you have at NYU, you do have um, resident um, composers in Bang Bang and Han who do a lot of cross culture. So I think it's looking at the reservoirs of talent that you have, and looking at seeing those residential ideas in young artists. Thank you very much for those comments. I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said. In fact, um, we'll be going uh, next month to Denver for the annual meeting of the Alliance of Artists Communities, which is a, a organization of artist residencies here in the US. And as sort of you alluded to, there's uh, sort of the big guns of residencies like Yado, but there are many smaller residencies. And there are institutions that um, organize residencies that maybe don't fit the traditional idea. Uh, like one of our partners here in New York is the Asian Cultural Council, um, which you know has apartments that they put folks up in, but um, and try to uh, bunch artists as close as possible together. But it's not like a this traditional idea, you know, being on the New England coast where <laughs> it's quiet and you seclude yourself. And in fact, that's one of the um, discussions we're hoping to have with the Alliance of Artist Communities and the members there is uh, sort of breaking out of the traditional mode of uh, a residency being a place for quiet contemplation and development of the work that it's uh, 
residencies are also very much a part of the communities where they're located. And it's a way um, to engage those artists, both because it uh, helps the creative process for the artists, um, but it's also um, good for the local communities. Uh, in particular about universities, um, this is uh, something the Doris Duke Foundation uh, does a fair amount of. Uh, their, through their Building Bridges program, um, they partner with um, universities and they fund uh, APAP, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, which has an artist residency uh, at universities uh, for Muslim artists in particular. And uh, it's a very enriching experience for the artist because it's, it's a way to engage with um, students uh, with faculty from a variety of disciplines, so not just faculty from the arts. Uh, and then is because, I mean, particularly outside of, say, New York or other big cities, um, often these universities are sort of the cultural hubs for their communities. So it's a, it's a very good way for the artists to engage the communities and it's, and it's sort of a good back and forth. And perhaps the, the, the takeaway then is the outreach for ensembles at Julia, because I know that the, the, in the Chamber Music Program at Julia, the students are much more interested in outreach than they are in playing Bach or, or Plato, then as the case mm -hmm. will be in the string quartet, but to have it as part as of the curriculum that if you feed in that as a component, then it, it stops becoming an elitist art form, and and it, it is it's, it's, it starts at a very young, young level. Uh, I think that's a very smart suggestion. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm you know uh, digesting a number of things that you're talking about. Um, uh, I've uh, been involved in a program in Kenya outside Nairobi. Uh, just outside Nairobi, there's a, uh, a very, very poor uh, neighborhood uh, in that area, and uh, many of the children are actually homeless. They, they have no, no place to live. And a program was started uh, for the arts, and it's music, dance, uh, visual arts, and then uh, they attracted the children because the children heard the music, heard the drumming, loved it, and then they had enough funding to build housing for the children, and so the children lived there, and then through the arts, they are beginning to learn math and other kinds of you know, educational uh, things, but it also gives them a sense of pride and, uh, and self-worth, prestige. And then enough money was raised to bring the children uh, to New York uh, to perform at the UN. And it was, it was really fantastic. It was such a great experience for them to have you know, this as the kind of pinnacle of all the work they had put in. And then for everybody else to experience what these kids were doing, knowing from you know, their, the history of their, of their past, and you know, it created a whole new life. So the arts can be essential. Right. And that's, as I said, one of the biggest challenges for the field is making the case to funders not in the arts that the arts are a critical component of community development or conflict resolution, um, that you know, USAID you know, has done some funding in terms of supporting arts and crafts as a, uh, you know, a, uh, an economic development uh, program in developing countries, but um, most of the foundations still don't get it. Um, you know, major foundations like Rockefeller pulled out of arts and culture completely. Um, they have a program on sustainable cities, and uh, I've I've made you know <laughs> the argument to them that you know the arts, and, as Mitch Landrieu of uh, New Orleans makes, you know, culture is part of New Orleans, and it's part of making. New Orleans, a sustainable city, a resilient city. That, that this idea that after Hurricane Tr Katrina, when they were able to put Mardi Gras back on and you know get you know the music back playing, it showed to the rest of the country that yes, we're a resilient city. And then yes, tourists were able to return, and yes, economic um, development started uh, happening again. Um, but it's um, it's <laughs> it's uh, someone. Uh, told me it's um, 
getting people who don't want to hear to listen. Um, so we have the argument, sometimes we have the arguments, but it's actually, you know, finding a willing ear uh, among public and private funders for a lot of this work. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Amanda Shasko. I'm from Vancouver, Canada. I'm a director for the BC Alliance of Arts and Culture. And I sort of have a question in regards to how much, uh, or do you have any research in regards to public arts? So for example, our group was at the UN yesterday, and in the plaza, part of cultural exchange between a lot of countries is to give a sculpture or a piece of public art. Um, there's a big thing now, I guess it's sort of more so happening in Canada, is participatory public art. So it's involving the community when the artist is over in that um, country to make the artwork with the community that's involved. I was wondering if you've done any research in that area. Um, we haven't in particular, and um, I mean, here's one of the dirty little secrets about social scientists is that you go where the data is. <laughs> So it's um, so part of it is you know having interesting questions that you want to find out the answers to, and part of it is having accessible data that you can fit your questions into. And unfortunately, I think public art probably falls into the category of there's not a lot of data, so it hasn't um, stirred a lot of uh, interest among social scientists. Um, part of that would be because, uh, say, in the U.S., side, so much of public art is local so there is no national clearinghouse which would have information on all of these types of projects it'd probably be a little interest easier in other countries which um, don't uh, have such a devolution of government as we uh, have here in the u.s where you might be able to find some uh, better data it's exceedingly important uh, as i said before mayors get you know get this they understand the importance of orchids and culture um, we're here in New York. The uh, former mayor, Michael Bloomberg, was a huge supporter of public art, um, part of that out of his own pocket uh, because he happened to be a billionaire. Um, but he did keep up the, the public funding co uh, commitment to uh, public art. Um, it's important, uh, you know, being able to walk past, you know, a sculpture in Union Square here in New York City. Um, it takes takes you out for just a moment in, in experiencing that art from the traffic and all of the pressure that is New York. Um, so it's an extremely important um, component of the arts, but um, it's one that we don't have a lot of data on. Thank you. Is there a final question or comment? Yeah, I would like to express our uh, sincere gratitude.